You've been interacting with your fellow devotees, fellow officers, and you're hearing about all the amazing work going on in their countries, in their areas, in their regions, and you've already sparked in you a lot of ideas. Because that's what has happened to me. Whether it is a conversation I've had with uh, Samba Sehorao Gauru from Africa, the amount of innovation going on there is incredible. The fact that 45% of the membership of the Sai organization in Africa is from the indigenous population really sparked my mind. How can we make that happen in the United States? And he was talking about a youth program, a youth development program that he has developed and engaged with the communities across many countries in Africa that has been a catalyst and many such other innovative ideas. Whether it is the conversations with Mr. Billy Fong, how he developed innovative ideas to engage with the Chinese community in Malaysia and include them in the organization. The conversations that I've had with Mr. Leonardo Guter about the amazing work going on in Latin America and what Dr. Reddy said about the 50th celebration, 50th anniversary celebration in Mexico, the number of people in the organization is all from the local population. Um, how did that happen? Public meetings after public meetings after public meetings and the patience and the commitment and the dedication to make it happen all the time. And, and we heard from uh, Brother Manoj, you know, he is in a zone that is, has an Islamic country, a Buddhist country, and you know, mixed population from Hindus and Christians. How, how is he working <laughs> in, in such an environment, bringing in these countries from different faiths together? The point I'm making, brothers and sisters, is innovation is already happening uh, in the organization. And what did Swami say? All names are mine, all forms are mine. Is there one way in which we can worship him? Impossible. We have tried very hard to create an idol of Swami and we can have, never get it right. And you know, remember the story where this artist finally said, Lord Krishna, I'll give you a mirror. That's all I can do because I can make a painting of you. The point is, we cannot confine God in any one form or one method or one way to do things. And the organization allows us within the framework of love and the values to express our creativity and our devotion in so many different ways. And why is that? Because we are inspired by the greatest creator, the greatest creativity talent that is available. Um, so I hope you have been inspired as much as I have been in talking to uh, all the brothers and sisters and, and all the amazing ideas and innovation that is happening. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna spend the next 90 minutes in three parts. And since we are starting late, I'm going to ask for that we, we probably conclude around 12.45 or so. Um, the first part is going to be about what steps can we take to accelerate our engagement with the broader community and further spread the message. There are eight billion people on this planet. Uh, Mr. Leonardo Guta said, we have to reach eight billion people. But Swami also said that, you know, human life is precious, but yet we are contemporaries, yet we are the few who have interacted with him, and yet we are even fewer who have been given this opportunity to serve him. But we can't keep the secret of Swami's message within ourselves. The world needs it more than ever. So we have to bring his message. Sometimes I feel it's the best kept secret in America. Swami's uh, message of uh, five values. And everywhere I go to, everyone I speak to, resonate with his message. But how do we make it happen? So, um, so the first part is going to be a panel discussion where we are going to share you know, people's perspectives on how, whether it's an organizational perspective or whether it's a personal perspective, um, as to how they have engaged with the community uh, and bringing Swami's message uh, to those communities. So I'd like to welcome our panel, distinguished panel, uh, Mr. Krishna Nair. All of you know I'm not going to reintroduce them. Um, he's a chair of uh, SSIO Zone 3. Uh, Mr. Manfred Muller, uh, chair of SSIO Zone 7. And then we have two special guests. Um, Dr. Geeta Govindarajan, I will introduce them briefly, and Ms. Rosaline Huesca.
again, as I said, my brothers here don't need further introduction, but I would love to uh, introduce um, Sister Geeta and Sister Rosaline. Um, behind those calm and uh, peaceful facade, there is a fearless and courageous uh, characteristic that, I have, uh, that we have experienced in our conversations with both of them. Um, Dr. Geeta Govindarajan is a, an internal medic medicine physician, scientist, and public health practitioner. She uh, earned her Master of Public Health from Harvard. She has a PhD in cellular physiology, and she's also an MD from George Washington University. And, you know, she has chosen to serve um, in, in what we call a medical desert area of Chicago, the suburbs of Chicago, which where the access to medical uh, services is limited, and it is also an area of uh, high incidence of violent crime. Um, so, uh, welcome, S uh, Sister Geeta, and I'd also like to introduce uh, Sister Rosaline, who is uh, the National Young Adult Coordinator of, of Mexico, and she's a lawyer and currently works at the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. And um, she has some interesting experiences to share. She has served um, uh, in, in, in similarly in, in high crime areas uh, like, like Sister uh, Gita has. So I'm very excited to uh, you know, share this panel with all of you. So I'm going to ask a, a few questions, go around uh, to each of them. Uh, it will be about 20, 25 minutes uh, for this part of the Innovative Ideas session. So I'd like to start with uh, uh, Brother Christian Nair. So the, you know, we think about the EHV program as a great asset that we can use to engage with the community. So we all need to get trained on EHV because the amount of work that's been done there to to make the language uh, more, more readily acceptable by the community is all very good. And I know that this, in Australia, uh, some of this work has been tried in which we can take the EHV broader. It's a great asset that can be more broadly adopted. Has anyone commenced working on sort of adapting this program to make it more readily acceptable uh, to the broader community? Thank you, Harish. And Jay Sairam, everyone. Jay Sairam. <laughs> Yes, uh, <clears throat> the EHV program is definitely a great asset of the Satisai International Organization. And uh, I like to borrow from what Aparna Murli said this morning about how Swami said to take this message across to the mother, you know, to uh, how she said, you need to put this in different colored glasses. Same content, but different colored glasses. That is what we have embarked on doing in Australia. We have taken the EHV and without in any way diluting or modifying the essence of the message, we have now put that into different colored glasses. The best people to do this, I found, will be the Institute of Satisai Education. The members of this institute are people who are soaked in EHV and Sai teachings. And they know exactly what it means. And they are the people, if you like, who can guard against any dilution or modification of the message. So we engaged them and we got them in touch with the different communities. If our community engagement team, for example, wants a, a message to take to the community, they will go to the institute and say, how can we take this message there without it being threatening to anyone in language that people can readily relate to and understand? So, we, they went about and they took this EHV package and developed it from scratch. When I say developed it from scratch without changing the asset, they looked at it and said, now what colored container can we use for this? And they said, okay, it is, what are you going to use it for? They said, first of all, let's look at the schools. You know. How can we take EHV into the schools? So we said, okay, we'll, let's call it container blue. So they put it into container blue, exactly the same, but in a different language. Very simple language that they, if you're going to use it in Australia, it'll have language that the Australian community can really readily relate to. Teachers in Australia can readily relate to. And they took it out 
they took a sample of about 14 people, 14 participants, to run a pilot program. And in this pilot program, they gave them assignments to do and look for feedback. How did you like the program? Was it okay? So people came back with various comments, like, look, it's brilliant, and these people are all side devotees, you know, so they, they knew what EHV was, and they knew exactly what it was. But they, they said, now don't wear the Psi hat, put a non-Psi hat, and let me see, let, tell me what it uh, feels like. And some of them came back and said, I think it's a bit too complicated. We need to modify this area a little bit, make it a little simpler, the language a bit simpler. So they went ahead and did that, and they're now still going through that process. So the pilot program is being run, and eventually, and we are actually testing it in our size school in Australia. Uh, once this is done, we will move it to other areas in zone three, and then we will tell everyone through in the world, this is now available if anybody wants to take it. And we'll tell you what, of the, what, color, what each of these colored containers contains, and where you can easily apply this. So the comment that Harish made at the beginning, that innovation is already there, EHV is already there, how can we now take it to the wider community and get them to readily accept this? This is one method we have used. Sairam. Sairam, Sairam brother. Well, one follow-up question to you is that, so once you have the right adaptation of EHV, you know, can you give us any example of where you have applied this? Yes. Uh, I mentioned the, uh, the education sector where we will take this. The next approach we have had is from the community engagement team where they wanted to, they looked at, this is uh, straight after COVID, and where there was a lot of uh, mental health issues, particularly with the frontline workers. And they wanted a package that we can now take to the community and say, let's look after your well-being, some affirmative action package. And they came up with this program called Care for the Caring. Again, they worked very closely. The community engagement people came and said, this is the problem we have, okay? And we think EH will work here, but we need it to be in a language that we can take it to the healthcare workers who are non-Sai people and just give them that, you know, without mentioning Swami's name, but the message is there. The message is there, the EHV is there. And uh, so they developed a package called Care for the Caring. Again, pilot run was run within the health community, within the uh, Sai medical unit, actually. Worked well, then we took it out to the wider community in Australia, then we took it to New Zealand and Fiji. Everybody was happy. We did some tweaking. We needed to do some tweaking for New Zealand and to Fiji. And then it was moved out throughout Zone 3. And then with Dr. Reddy's blessing, we said now it's available for adoption by anyone. That package is readily available. So that is a adaptation of the EHV for the healthcare community. Sairam, thank, thank you, you. brother. EHV is, there's so much more we could be doing with EHV, and that's one example of how EHV has been adapted for a specific set of local needs, and it is being iterated and continuously improved upon. I'd like to uh, now move to um, um, Sister Dr. Geeta Govindarajan. Um, you know, she has, um, she loves to walk the path that's less traversed by many. And, you know, she, and that has motivated her to engage in some of the toughest neighborhoods in the country. So th the question to you is, how has Swami inspired you to work in, this, in a tough neighborhood? And you know, what has inspired you to actually engage with this population? Sairam, everybody. Can you hear me? Sairam, it's um, super awesome to be here. Um, I was not expecting to be here. Um, and so it's always uh, part of the concept of loving the uncertainty principle has written very high in my life. And I find myself um, speaking to all of you. There's a whole bunch of thoughts that come when you phrase that question. I think the simplest way I can say it is I'm a product of three or four World Youth Conferences that have happened in the, uh, in the August presence of our beloved Padvan. And I think in the, after the first World Youth Conference, uh, when um, there were three, four things that came out of it that I remember, and I've taken that to heart. One was do not wallow in mediocrity. Go out there, get out of your comfort zone and do something and inspire the world. Two, yoga shema effect, and it's really legit because it happens. You do God's work and he does, 
he works overtime for you. And I can give you numerous experiences that pretty much um, you know, emphasize that uh, fact. The third part of it is a concept that I heard for the first time in the World Youth Conference um, with um, our Malaysian uncles who have been really an inspirational um, you know, guideposts uh, and s who speak through, uh, through Swami's messages to me. And one of that was this concept of dare to be divine. And I think that pretty much triggered something that was undeniable as an impressionable teenager at that time to come back to the city of Chicago and pick the worst neighborhoods um, in the inner city, which was the Inglewood area, and go out and do things. And at that time, it was very different than what our centers were used to, which was sandwich projects and things like that. But to adopt a community and go there and do things was something unheard of um, in the Midwest. And so we, a group of us who were equally um, empowered by the World Youth Conference went out there and did a lot of work. Um, part of it was my interest being in healthcare um, made us become part of this community where a free clinic was set up. As I moved along um, through my training, I realized that um, I was interested in global health and I would do all these medical camps or medical missions through other organizations and also through the Sci organization. But I felt that there was always a gap left behind after we left the place. So there was never a sustainable movement in you know, making an impact or measuring your impact. And so I felt the best way, and at that time I was looking for ways to serve and an opportunity presented itself in the form of a three month gig at a, at a community health center in the south side of Chicago. I had no idea what that was. And I decided to take a plunge and go there for a three month um, you know, assignment. I thought I would do that, figure out what I wanted to do with my life and come back and do something else. Uh, mind you, because I had so many different degrees that I didn't know how to kind of weave them all together. And um, three months has now turned into nine and a half years at the same location. Um, and there's so much work to be done. Um, it's incredible to see the level. There is no abject poverty that we see in Africa or, or in Southeast Asia. It's the unseen poverty of the inner city uh, neighborhoods of our biggest cities. Chicago is ridden with violence um, through guns. Uh, there's a huge opioid epidemic. There is a huge drug infestation. So that our impact as the Satya Sai organization and taking the message of Swami to these communities is our biggest imperative. Um, to see our continued work in this one specific location of Inglewood um, through the work by partnering with an organization called Port Ministries has been like the changing game changer for me and many of the youth that got to participate in those um, activities. And we went with the name SAI, which is Serve and Inspire, so to make it simple, but Swami's name is still on there. And we managed to partner and do a lot of health-related work in that space. Uh, part of it was recognizing that sometimes healthcare doesn't mean that the patient has to come into our walls, but we go out into the community. So we would partner with the bread truck, I would, and me and another um, young adult who was equally inspired to do it, would go out to neighborhoods in the middle of the evening after our work was done. We would ride with the bread truck and we would do a lot of preventative health um, visits for our patients in the corners where we knew there was a lo lot of uh, drug activity going on. Um, what we realized was that there's definitely a lot of people who have access to healthcare but do not know how to come back into our healthcare systems. Two, there's a lot of mental health uh, needs which we have heard about over and over again in the Oregon, uh, during these last several days. And number three, there is a knowledge gap. They do not know how A leads to B. And it is our responsibility sort of to bridge that gap. So if we take even little tiny steps, I think we have the way to sort of make that spark go off. We don't need to recreate new things, but if we as organization could just be a bridge and strengthen the, the systems, the healthcare systems that's very fragmented, at least in the United States, and be a powerhouse to propel those healthcare systems to provide the help that's needed, 
I think our work would be done. And I think it may not come in the form of a medical camp, but it may come from a sustainable impact because it's run by the community, for the community, for the community, for, the, for those people that truly want to see you know, things change. And I think we have the ability to truly do social medicine because there's so much um, interest and there's so much talent within the organization amongst the youth. Um, I think there's, there's n we just have to walk that one step and, and create a critical mass and then the tipping point happens. Thank you, Sister Abby, so much to unpack, uh, but nine and a half months, I mean, I'm sure that, <laughs> nine and a half years, I'm, I'm sure that uh, people in the Psi 100 group would love to interview you and get all those ideas out and see what we can do. And I know that Dr. Rama Devi is also talking about the social medicine, how we can use values uh, as a prescription, actually. I think that's what you're talking about. It's a bridge the gap. Maybe the values is the bridge, but thank you. Uh, you know, if we have time, we'll come back. I have more questions. Um, I'd like to move on to uh, Brother Manfred. You know, we heard about the innovation that is happening in Ukraine. The war has created so much uncertainty, and the work that the zone is doing in Europe is innovation. Uh, they have hired, uh, I think, they have a facility in central Ukraine, Vezinitsa? Vienitsa. In central Ukraine, that is a warehouse where food and other materials are sent from within Ukraine and other parts of Europe, and then the local people on the ground in Ukraine, volunteers on the ground, are distributing that. There has been work done with the officials of Ukraine so that there is easier passage to people from Europe in and out of Ukraine. There is so much innovation that's going on there, and it's all inspired by Swami. And, and, and Brother Manfred has been an entrepreneur and has been in business for many years, and specifically, you know, you are in the business of reducing waste or recycling waste. And, you know, I was really fascinated by how you connected Swami's universal values with your business and sort of changed the local ecosystem of people that you are working with. Uh, do, you, do you mind sharing how you were able to do that? Okay, say around. First of all, when I got the invitation, I thought, well, what is this conference going to be all about? And immediately, a commercial came into my mind that is quite popular right at the moment in Germany. And this is a 15 seconds commercial. And, and what I did was, I simply had to undertitle it new in order to get the message over to what we are going to talk about. And I would like to share this commercial with you and Please have a look at the screen. Ich mag die roten am liebsten. Mhm. Stell dir mal vor, wir könnten meinen roten Goldbärchen einbuddeln und dann kommt ein riesengroßer Goldbärbaum nur mit roten. Das ist die beste Idee, die ich je gehört habe. Now you see, that is what is this all about. Is there a seed we can implant and it blossoms in every human heart? There are two major messages in this little commercial. First of all, it is always the one and only seed. This is exactly what Brother Krishnan just told us. We don't have to change the content. It is always one seed. But we have to think about the different ways of how to plant it on the different soils that we find. And this is the situation I was in when I started my business because I, for 20 years I had been a management trainer and I was hired by the big companies. And they of course told me what to do. They told me the items I had to train with their management. So I always had Swami's message and the five human values in my pocket, but I always had to somehow make them get into this seminar. 
So I, th when you said it is the best secret, these five human values, yes, that is what I felt all the time. And then I had a chance to run a business on my own, a recycling company. And um, I thought, well, everything starts with the individual. So I, I can't wait for anyone else to, to send out this message. It has to be myself. Um, and I wanted to run this company based on the five human values. So what I did, one of the first things I did was I got printed a huge transparent. It was about five meters wide and three meters high. And I placed it right in the central building of my company so that everybody could see it. And you see, recycling is about creating values. In my case, we recycle electronic waste and we get gold and silver and palladium and all this out of it. So there was the slogan written, we create values. But underneath, it was not gold, silver and palladium. It was truth, righteousness, love, peace, and nonviolence. <laughs> so what happened? Whenever we had visitors, new customers, the authorities, people from the neighborhood that were interested in what we were doing, I took them around the company, and it always ended up in front of this transparent. And I said, this is basically you have seen now what we do, but you still don't know how we do it. And this is a secret, I won't tell you. I won't tell you how we, how we get these values out, but I tell you how we treat the people with whom we are working with. We treat them on the basis of these five values. This is the most important thing we do here in this company. And this makes the difference to every other company. And then we started to talk about these values. And this is interesting. This is interesting. Especially the higher the ranking of the visitors was, whether it was management structure, CEOs, what, whatever, then you suddenly saw that they lack orientation in their life and that there is a an urgent need for something to rely on which is not changing as everything else around them. So they suddenly said, well, but this is brilliant. This is everything I do. I can base on these five human values. Every decision I have to take, before I do this decision, I can sit there and can just have some small thoughts. Is it true what I'm doing here? Is it, is it the right conduct? Is it the way how I plan to do it? Is it the right way to do it? Does it lead to more peace? Does it violate anyone else? And at the end of the day, is it filled with love? Four very, five very easy questions, but a clear compass to bring you to the right action. And when I started this, it was interesting that suddenly people came and said, yes, 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 but we want to do more, we want to know more of how you do it. And then I started to switch this over to SSEHV. We launched a program and said, well, we have these five human values. We teach them to children. Uh, we teach them within our Psy community. Uh, so let's take a different soil. Let's, for example, take the management soil and let's think of how we put this message into the right container. And then we developed a program for managers. And the moment we did that, the employees came and said, yes, but my, my problem is slightly different. Um, you see, I, I have the feeling I'm something like a part-time devotee. 
On Thursday evening, when we sing bhajans, my heart is open, everything is fine. On Friday morning, I have to go to my company. I don't dare to speak about Swami. I don't dare about to speak about him. So how can I transport this so that I don't have to hide myself away? How can I be Swami's devotee in the, in, in the surrounding of my workplace? And once again, you have to find a different language. You have to find a different approach. And we developed a program of, well, how can everybody of us who is lacking this, this ability to communicate that, how can we teach them how to do that at the end of the day to gain more happiness out of it? So this is just the first short part of the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Value from Jake for Sir Jody for making us a good slide. <laughs> um, you know, Brother Krishna and I was asking about ethics in business, and you actually got the answer from <laughs> Brother Manfred. You know, this is a amazing way of applying Swami's values in a business profession environment, and there's more to the story where the whole ecosystem of people that uh, Brother Manfred is working with, they all began to correct themselves in terms of their own bad practices and, uh, and unethical practices. So there's a lot here. I'd like to move on to uh, Sister Rosaline. The state of Sonora in, in Mexico <laughs> is, uh, is competes with uh, the inner community of Chicago in terms of violent <laughs> crime. Um, and. Uh, I think it has a large presence of drug cartels. Yeah. And somehow she found herself there. And I would love for her to sort of briefly share your experience and how your faith in Swami gave you that necessary courage and how that led you to where you are today. Hi, Ram. So uh, being a lawyer in Mexico is a hard thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> and you may ask why I chose to be a lawyer. Well, both of my parents are lawyers, <laughs> so yeah. it was like a natural thing to do. So uh, in the beginning of my career, I was working in a firm, and every day I was facing the challenge of deciding whether to bribe someone or not, <laughs> and that was pretty complicated. But one day, um, I had the chance to go to, to Prashanti, and hearing one of the elders talking about something that he used to do every time he was there, uh, he, he said that he was writing in a notebook like 10 wishes that he was making uh, to Swami. So uh, he said like, oh, give it a chance. So I said, oh, well, I'm gonna do it. And I tried to write 10 things, but I just wrote four. <laughs> and in those four I wrote something like, uh, Swami, please put me in some place where I can uh, do what I studied, like something related to the legal field, but where I'm not exposed to all this corruption and, and that I can make a really, uh, like a difference. So that was in November 2017 when I came back to Mexico in January, it was January 2nd, uh, I got like a phone call and they were telling me, you have to go to Monterrey in the north part of Mexico because you're gonna start working here <laughs> from Monday. So we're like, whoa, <laughs> that was fast. <laughs> and it was a consultancy company uh, working with uh, international cooperation like USAID and INL, which is the narcotics office uh, from the United States. So they were giving funds to Mexico and this company was uh, in charge of implementing this program to, um, to make better the criminal justice system in Mexico. I, I may say that when I was in college, I didn't like criminal, the criminal field because, well, you hear criminal field and yeah, there is a lot of money going under the table and a lot of shady things happening. But when I heard that I had to do that, because I was in employment law before, I said, well, Swami, Swami, <laughs> Swami will do it, everything, we will do everything. So I tried and I started learning uh, on the crimin criminal field. And my work was uh, to train all the prosecutors in the state of Sonora. Uh, the amazing thing here was uh, the, gener the attorney general from that state, she was so committed. She was a woman of faith. And so we had this um, communication from heart to heart. It was really smooth to work with her. She was every time asking for my opinion, which is not common because I'm a young person. So most of the times they go and ask someone else. But she, every time that I was working with her, I felt that I was working with Swami. So all the changes, 
everything that I was doing, uh, she was approving everything. And when I, when I had to go to these cities that, yeah, they were dangerous. I was working also in the border and dealing with uh, really heavy stuff. But every time, it was Swami. And when I was talking to the, to the prosecutors that I had to train, I was just imagining them with this afro. <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> they are all Swami, so they are going to get the, the message. And yeah, we really could see difference there. So uh, it's really hard to attend all the investigations in one state, especially with a very high, high rate of criminality. But we started to have like all the prosecutors increase their, their numbers. So if they were uh, solving like one case per week, they were doing in a month like 10, 20. It was going, like the numbers were going up. So it was really amazing and that like uh, called the attention of all the other states because the, the attorney general was giving like really, really good numbers. But I all the time felt that it was Swami doing the work. And from there, uh, well now, um, in, that, in that job, like the things started to get a little bit complicated and I prayed Swami again, like Swami, please, I'm having a little bit of difference with my boss, so I, I need to be in another place. And from that job, I got another job in the UN, in the Office of, uh, on Drugs and Crime, and they, are, uh, they put a lot of emphasis on the values. So whenever they said, we have to follow these values, people who work here, they, they have strong ethics. So I felt that it was Swami. It was like a mirror, so whenever I have asked Swami to put me in the right place, he does that like really quick. It seems hard, like doing his job is hard, because we have to do it with full trust that he's gonna give us the tools to make it. So we just have to ask for it and he will just provide. Sairam. Sairam. <laughs> Sometimes we think we are innovating, but actually Swami is innovating through us. You know, he sends the right people to the right places and it's automatically happening. You know, but we, we, we also want some of that credit, so we'll also do some innovation. <laughs> um, so uh, a big hand to this panel. <laughs> Thank you so much. We're going to move, move to the next section of this, <laughs> of this uh, you know, innovative session, which is how do we intensify our efforts in a changing world and stick to the practice of Swami's message in our daily lives. So, you know, we talk about innovation in terms of community engagement. Now we're gonna talk about innovation in terms of our personal lives and our personal transformations. And how do we leverage the organization and how do we leverage the size center? When I was growing up, black and white TV was a distraction. Did I say black and white? I, I, I just gave away how old I was. But, uh, and then, of, of course, color TV and VCRs and so on. Now it is it's out of control, the amount of distractions. I remember in, in the late 90s, I was working on media technologies for the internet. And I had an interview with Swami, and I said, Swami, I want to put your uh, audio <laughs> on the internet. And Swami said, no, 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 Bangaru, not, not. In the internet, they show good and bad. So, so I took it as, look, technology and all of this is available but we have to have a level of discrimination when we use it or not use it. So the word innovation doesn't mean anything unless we have the young adults uh, you know, participate. So I'm going to hand it over to Alexis Trevino, who is the uh, national coordinator, young adult coordinator for Mexico, and he will take us to the next 20, 25 minutes. Sayram, everyone. I would like to offer my most grateful and most humble pranams at the divine lotus feet of my dear Lord, Sati Sai Baba, who's been my guide and who's been one of the greatest driving forces in my entire life. So, 
I would like to begin with a little quote by Swami. This was during a discourse. He asked his devotees, so, Prema Swaruplata, do you know how does a penguin build a house? Yeah, really deep question. So, of course, they were all startled like, or does anyone have a clue what the answer might have been? So, Swami saw the visible confusion in everyone's faces and he said, well, he glues it together. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, he didn't say that. I mean, <laughs> just totally made that up. Just to, so, having broken some eyes, I will tell you a quote he really said and which we have so generously recorded. So, he says, young people should consider the true purpose of life. They should get rid of all the impurities from their hearts. With pure hearts, they should embark on service at all times and everywhere, hands in society, head in the forest. From today, develop an unwavering mind and a steady vision. That is the way to divinize the world. Yes, this was really said in July 16, 1997, in case you don't trust me. <laughs> So with that, having that said, I would really like to say a little, in, little insight that Brother Aravind shared with us. Swami, out of all his time, he spent most of his time with students. And there's a reason to this, because Swami had always said that students are the future leaders of tomorrow. So in this section, I would like to introduce two renowned and distinguished young adults that have really, really embodied these values and that through their life stories, they have really showed that Swami's message has been ingrained in their life. So our first speaker is Karan Bali, who is a 35-year-old living in the island of St. Lucia, a former atheist turned ardent devotee of Swami since 2017 after experiences multiple miracles from Swami. He is also the West Indies Young Adult Coordinator for the male section. His life purpose now is to share his experiences and stories and work with struggling, demotivated, and doubtful young adults in finding their way to Swami and coming closer to recognizing their true self. So let's all give a big and hearty welcome to Karan Bali. Saram, everyone, how are you all feeling? I'm not feeling the energy, can you? How are you feeling? How is everyone feeling? Energized? Yes? Great. My name is Karan Bali. As Alexis introduced, I'm the West Indies Young Adult Coordinator. If you asked me this question five years ago, I would say, as a radical atheist, my idols were Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris. I used to go convincing people there was no rel religion was manipulation and God didn't exist. And this was my life mission because I felt like religion was, was the problem of this planet. Everyone was fighting in the name of God. Uh, God wasn't there. Clearly, he's letting his children fight. And I felt my service to humanity was to convince people to open their eyes. So I made that my life mission. And I worked very hard at it until Swami came and... Uh, you know, it takes a lot to convince someone who's built their entire identity on this one thing, that there is a God, and he's here in human form, and he's doing everything. So Swami had to put a lot of work in. One miracle wasn't enough. Two wasn't enough. It had to keep going over and over. I kept doubting myself. My mind started playing tricks. You're seeing things happening. Every time I said, no, it didn't happen, happens right again. Swami kept doing that. And you know, it's still, five years later, it still happens. 
this discussion, while I was getting ready for this, and I'm talking to the panel about what my topic will be as I open Facebook, Swami talks about distractions. When I ask a question, I open a book. First line, my eyes fall on is the answer to it. If I'm in fear, if I'm struggling, I open this, why fear? I'm here. Open Instagram, why fear? I'm with you. Open this, my whole social media is the same thing. I'm with you, why are you afraid? So now I feel like Swami is not just a play writer, he's also the people in the play, he's also the play itself. I feel like I'm in a simulation of Swami, you know? This is my life now. So my topic is going to be distractions. Uh, most of you already have all the knowledge of Swami. I'm, I'm very new. I'm still learning. I don't read as much. You all are enlightened souls. So I'll speak out of the box. My own personal experiences and how I have realized certain things. Actually, it's funny this topic uh, came to me because I had this realization just a month ago and I started applying certain things in my life and I saw the changes. So when they said, please speak, I was like, okay, sure. And they brought this topic. I was like, oh, look, Swami, you're working. You know? Um, so distractions. Let's talk about distractions for a second. What are distractions? Why do we indulge in distractions? When we're young, we see a toy and we want that toy and we throw tantrums and we do this and we do that. I want that toy. And we get the toy and we're joy. You know, the toy is joy. Everything is, is joy. And for two weeks, you're like all of it, vroom, vroom, rah, rah, rah. Two weeks later, the toy isn't there. Next item. Right? The joy is gone, the toy is useless, you're looking for the next source of joy. And this goes into adulthood, and now we're looking at a, a, a real car, a Tesla, you know, a lot of you like Teslas nowadays. Um, and I need that Tesla, and you work for months, and you get the Tesla, and now you're like an adult going vroom, 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 vroom. And after two weeks again, joy is gone, you get in the Tesla, this time you're like, okay, whatever. Next thing. Isn't it a pity that we've grown up and the object has changed, but the mentality hasn't changed. You look at a 60-year-old, the exact same attitude as a five-year-old child of the toy. Right? Is, is that not sad? There's been no growth. But when you look deeper in, I can give quotations of Swami and, you know, say all these things, and they sound profound, but you've got to break down the mentality. What's making them act this way? The truth is, in those two weeks that you get that toy or that car, that bliss that you feel, it feels like home. This is your true nature. This is your home. But the problem is our monkey mind has set conditions on how to re reach home. He doesn't let you feel home naturally. He says, hey, I like to consume. So if you want to feel that, and if you want me to keep quiet, you got to get me this. So what happens? You get the car, monkey mind is like, okay, joy. I'll give you two weeks of joy, you know, barter. Monkey mind is silent, and your joy. Now let me ask you all a question. Everyone is in here, you have desires, yeah? Yes, absolutely, we all have desires. Have you thought about it since you've been here? Or are you just lost in Swami right now? Why, why is that? Because you are feeling your natural state. What you're looking for outside is to feel your natural state within. And you're here now, and you're feeling that, so all of a sudden that outside item doesn't matter to you anymore. You are in your natural state. The question here is now, what can I do to maybe say manipulate my mind to be a little nicer? You know, mind is like a knife. It can either uh, kill someone or it can do surgery. So what can I do to make this mind a little better? I will just plant some seeds. I'm actually glad he brought up seeds because that's what I was talking about to um, other people. So I'm going to plant some seeds. So I'm going to plant three seeds in your head today. This universe has been... We say about 12.8 billion years, probably less, probably more, you know, we don't know. But we know it's billions of years. Since the Big Bang, there's been kinetic energy, chemical reactions, galaxies have formed. Earth is formed. Earth becomes habitable. There's flora and fauna. And there's grueling evolution. And after all the evolution, human beings are here. And amongst those human beings, you look at every single person, not a single one of you looks the same. Your experiences are diverse. It'll never be the same as somebody else. Is that not proof of Swami's love and grandeur? That he made you that unique? That even if tomorrow someone made a genetically exact same version of you, it'll still not be you. 
because you are a bundle of experiences. Do you not feel unique by yourself? Do you not feel happy that you are here? This moment will never come back again. We'll have many international conferences, but this conference on this day will never come back. Does that not make this place important? Does that not make this place a perfect opportunity? Are we living in the present to appreciate that? Are we? We should be. But if you're caught up in the past and the future, are you seeing it? No. Be in this moment. Secondly, all of you here are devotees of Swami. He's called you the same way he called me. Swami was kind enough to, you know, I, my, with my relation with Swami is always I ask a question, he gives the answer. Swami, I used to make fun of you. There are so many bad things going on. I used to go and say those bad things about you. Why me? Swami is kind enough to make me learn about two of my past lives. And both lives I did immense spiritual practice. So that was my answer, that you've done so much work. Don't waste it. I don't care what you said about me before, but you have work to do. You are so close in this marathon. Finish it up. Now, when Rama came, he came to one kingdom and he fought a demon of another kingdom. And that cultural impact has built our entire civilization. When Krishna came, he guided Arjuna on a battle against multiple kingdoms from middle India all the way to Afghanistan, Gandhara, Gandhari, is Kandahar, right? Multiple kingdoms against Krishna, did, and, and look at the impact it's had on our culture, look at where we are today. Now this is just small part of India, bigger part of India. This avatar is global, and in his time, we're not going down and you guys are going up. Do you know the cultural and the global impact this will have for years to come? Hundreds of years from now, people will sit there and say, you know, the same way we talk about Gopikas, oh, I wish I was with Krishna. They're going to sit here and say, I wish I was with Swami. And you all are here in this moment, in the Purna Aftar and his biggest mission. Do you not feel like you've hit the jackpot? Is that not a reason to wake up every single day and say, I'm happy? Do you feel that way? Or are you caught up in your day-to-day -day life, in your, in your distractions? That's the hardest part. Swami is saying, you've done so much work in so many lives and you've come this close. Finish the marathon, but then you're looking here, oh, look at that tree. Look at this. Look at that. That's what distractions are. So please get your focus right. But what do we do when it's deeper than distraction, when it's destruction? How do we, how do we navigate feelings when, when we're going through a hard time? I won't speak about how to deal with it. I will speak about my life. Um, the reason I was an atheist was because I had a very hard life. I was comfortable. Then my parents went bankrupt. I dropped out of college. My, my, both my parents became sick. I took care of them for 15 years now. I've been taking care of them. Um, I lost, we lost everything. We lost finances, money. People dropped off. Uh, went through a bunch of sicknesses, pain. I used to take morphine every week for God knows how many things. I started losing my eyesight. And I was at my lowest moment and I said, if there's a God, how can you watch me suffer? What's wrong with you? You know, show me yourself. Two, three days later, miracles started happening. But I didn't know it was, it was Swami. So I started, you know, rewiring myself, trying to figure out what, what's happening. But that wasn't the end of it. After that happened, things started changing. I went for my surgery and all these things. A Category 5 hurricane hit my island and decimated everything. We had nothing left. We moved to St. Lucia and I had to restart my life with my two sick parents. I had to figure out what do I do from here. But you know what? After finding Swami, there was a sense of peace and security. I was rebuilding my life with nothing. I had a few hundred dollars in my pocket and a suitcase and that was it. And two sick parents. And I never felt like I was done. I never felt like I was dejected. And five years later, I'm here. I just kept saying, Swami, you've shown me so many miracles. You'll get me through it. I'll just keep doing the action. I'll do the work. I'll focus day to day. Brothers and sisters, I, I have not read the Gita very well, but I understand one thing about Arjuna. Arjuna was so clear in his vision, even though so many people were against him. And you know what? When your life is in the line, I can tell from personal experience, when you face assault or when life is in the line, that's when your mind goes crazy. And I know how that feels personally. But here's Arjuna with so much clarity that 
when Krishna gave him a choice between him and the army, and he clearly needed the army, he's outnumbered quite badly, he chooses Krishna. And when he chose Krishna, the only time he wavered wasn't because he had fear for his death. He knew what he had with him. He only wavered because he didn't want to kill his family members. Look at that clarity. Brothers and sisters, today I'm standing here because I have Arjuna's clarity. My life is Swami's message of transformation. And now I understand that I had to be reduced to nothing and emptied out to realize that I'm Swami's instrument and I've dedicated my life to serving Swami. And it's an offer to anyone you ever need me, just reach out. You ever come to St. Lucia, I have a place for you to stay. Any side devotee, I promise Swami that personally, that Swami, if you give me a decent house, I will entertain anybody. Today, I work for the richest man in St. Lucia, running his business, starting my own business, taking care of my family to my best, to my best ability, and I cannot take any credit for that. I am a zero, I'm a proud zero, and I am everything because of Swami. Sarah. Thanks a lot, Bro Karan, for sharing your such a deep story, for sharing your, your values, and for giving us, because at least for me, I was given this courage to follow Swami, to let him be the charioteer, as Arjuna had Krishna as his charioteer. So let's give Bro Karan another round of applause. Next up, we have Priya Paneer Selvam. So she is an obstetrician and gynecologist. She is from the Bay Area and is working at the county hospital where she trains residents and cares for the underserved. She was fortunate to grow up in Swami's fold and went through the SSE program from, from group one. As a YA, she has been involved with medical camps and clinics, computer literacy classes for mothers in rehab, and teaching for migrant farm workers. She is the product of a single parent home. And the credit for where she is today goes to her father. So let's all welcome Sister Priya with a big round of applause. Om Shri Sai Ram. I offer myself and I offer this work at your lotus feet. Sign on, everyone. What is our purpose? Why are we here? I believe it is oneness. First and foremost, unity within ourselves, thoughts, words, and deeds. Next, unity with others. And finally, unity with the divine. How can we utilize our Psi centers to achieve this oneness? A few weeks ago was Easter Sunday. My sister and I, many of you know her as um, I am AI, Atomic Intelligence. Uh, and I have to give her credit, she did most of the work for the Easter program. Uh, <laughs> we had to come up with an Easter program for Sunday. So we, you know, put together a bunch of unison songs, worked with the center, we did a rehearsal, we had a guitarist, we had a keyboard player, we were all set. We even worked with two SSC students and we told them, hey, we'll coach you. You come up here, write a script, talk about Easter, let's get the message of Christ across. We did all this work. Guess what? Two hours, two hours before the program, who didn't show up? One of the SSC students. The instrumentalist just happened to be out of town mysteriously. It was great. Two hours before, it was our job to scramble and figure out what the heck are we gonna do? <laughs> so one of the, the lone standing SSE students said, okay, Priya, Sai, I can do this. I can, I, can, I can do this, yeah. I'll talk for both of us. I'll give the whole speech. And we said, yeah, you go girl. We will stand behind you, you give that speech. And then I looked at my sister and said, this is gonna be a disaster. <laughs> you got to do something. So my sister, in her divine inspiration, came up with a very quick, powerful talk on Christ and sacrifice and all this cool stuff, right? We show up at the center. 
not only is there a guitar player, a keyboard player, and a percussionist with electronic drum set, okay? My sister's speech, amazing. The entire center felt moved with the power of Christ. The unison songs were so powerful that the devotional coordinator came up to us and said, hey, can you guys do the Eid program next week? <laughs> An SSE student heard this, and she came up to us, and she said, can I speak for Eid? If you take one step towards him, he will take 99 towards you. All of this drama made me remember my own personal experiences in the Sci Center. You see, it takes a village to raise a child. When I was 13 and when my sister was six, our mom died from ovarian cancer. The aunties from our center took me to school every single day, taught me how to cook, gave us food, took us clothes shopping. We would not be here if it weren't for those aunties. Beyond that love, Beyond that love and support, the Sci Center gave me opportunities. When I was in SSE, we wrote, directed, acted in plays. We sang, we came together, we, we created bands, we composed songs. We started a service project that lasted 15 years, only stopped because of COVID. And that was when we were in eighth grade. We were also rebels. We caused a lot of drama. <laughs> you can imagine teenagers going to a very homogenous Sci Center where everything was in Sanskrit and struggling to connect with Swami. So we fought, we fought for English budgets. We fought for an English arathi on top of the Sanskrit. And yes, we got in trouble, <laughs> but it was worth it because now in our center for every prayer, there is an English version too. All these skills, all this conviction Swami gave me were imbibed with love, truth, righteousness, peace, and nonviolence. And guess what? Those are superpowers. Superpowers that I was able to take to my professional life. I'm a doctor. I take care of women, underserved women. I've made a commitment to that. I do surgery. I deliver babies. I love my job. But guess what? Every doctor was once a resident, and residency is torture. So <laughs> my residency was four years. It was in Ohio. And guess what? I was the first person of color in 10 years. I was surrounded by women who looked like Barbie. Can you imagine the amount of estrogen in that program? <laughs> I also was the most hated person in that program. They treated me like garbage. I got screamed at every day. I wanted to quit. Listen, I lost my mom. You don't think, I, I know what struggle is. I know what difficulty is. And still, I wanted to leave. An interesting opportunity arose. How many people here, raise your hand, if you have done Swami's Jyoti meditation? Okay, pretty much everybody, right? Yeah. I had the crazy idea of doing this Jyoti meditation with my fellow co-residents. Yeah, I know, nuts. Uh, I sat them all down, turned off the lights, lit a candle, had them sit back straight, did, all, you know, did the whole thing. And I said, envision a flame or a light bulb if you want. Bring it through your body, let it cleanse you. Spread it to everyone, especially people you don't get along with. Uh, <laughs> and here I am, like furiously spreading love to these people, right? Okay. Um, so, sorry, now I'm losing my train of thought. <laughs> uh, at the end of that session, I was given a lot of feedback. The first was, thank you for talking about the light bulb because I envisioned the world in flames. The second was, I'm gonna go and shoot beams of light at the surgeon I'm working with because he's a jerk. I said, great. And the third was I'm gonna teach this to my kid because I want her to be grounded. After all this, everything changed overnight. I was treated differently. Patients of color were treated differently. Somali refugees who residents rolled their eyes at when they were struggling to push were not treated that way. Spanish patients who asked for epidurals and were dismissed. That behavior stopped overnight. Look, one meditation. Look at his power with godless people. So I have three requests for everyone today in conclusion. The first, let us all strive to have unity of our thoughts, words, and deeds. The second, let us make our Psy Center's uh, celebrations of unity and diversity, where a person walking down the street can walk in and feel welcome no matter what their background is. The third, 
Let us create communities and villages for our children where we raise them to have these opportunities, get these superpowers, these skills. Let them be leaders, not just in our Psy community, but in the world. Imagine a president who lived love all, serve all. Imagine that world where children could go to school and be safe. If we could raise the next generations of leaders who live, love all, serve all, and do his work in the communities and in the world, we would have a completely different world. Jay Sidon. Thank you, Sister Priya, for sharing us your life story and how Swami helped you overcome all these hurdles and difficulties and how you became a beam and a beacon of inspiration for all your co-residents. So let's give Sister Priya another round of applause, please. <laughs> and with that, we're going to wrap up this second section of this workshop. So now I'm going to hand the microphone to Bro Harish. Thank you. Thank you. Wasn't it amazing? Yeah. We want to hear from the YAs. They are our future, right? Are we in good hands? Yeah. Now, we had three speakers for this panel. We ran out of time for the third speaker. Can I ask your forgiveness to add the third speaker back? Yeah. Yes, so... Um, Alexis. <laughs> so we will go up to 1250, not 1245. So can you please introduce a third speaker? So our third speaker is our dear Shruti. So let's all welcome her with a big round of applause. I just want to say that she also has a really deep life story, which I'm really sure we'll all feel related to, and that will inspire us to become courageous and have a deeper faith in our Lord. So, hand it over to you, sis. Sarah. Sarah, everyone. Thank you so much, Brother Alexis, for this warm welcome. And um, I hope you guys are all enjoying this conference as much as I am, because I'm learning so much. So... Today I was asked to talk about how to intensify our sadhana in our daily life. Well, one, one experience happened in my life that really taught me how to intensify the sadhana. So I was hit with a bout of depression when I was 19 years old and I didn't know how to cope up with it. It was like, it was like this hollow emptiness and I didn't know why I felt this craziness because it was unexplainable, it was causeless, because everything was going great in my life up until that point. My grades were booming, my health was fine, my, I didn't have any financial troubles because my parents took care of everything. So I had everything going for me. So when I was hit with this bout of depression, I didn't know how to deal with it. Um, and on top of that, I was also having nightmares. And it was like nightmares of things that I thought I, uh, thought I had already worked through it, but they were coming up in flashes as nightmares, and I didn't know how to deal with it. So I turned to God. You know, I, tr I tried to do bhajans, I tried to do meditation, nothing was working. I went to therapy, nothing was working. I went to a psychiatrist. They decided they're gonna put me on antidepressants, but I was like, no, you know, I really wanna rely on God. But um, at that point, I still didn't know how to deal with it. Uh, so I chose not to take up the medications. And I chose, it, chose to rely on God completely. And at this point, uh, I was prompted by a dear friend who, uh, who told me about the Sai Satcharitra. She told me, if you read the Sai Satcharitra, maybe you will be healed. So I decided that I was going to read it, but I didn't have a book. I didn't have that book. So we decided that we were gonna watch a movie of the Shirdi Sai life story. And as soon as I watched it, that was the first night that I slept 
in peace, like complete peace, no nightmares, nothing. And the following days after that, my depression completely subsided. And I didn't understand. Thank you so much. Yes. So that's exactly what happened. That is the miracle that Swami works through. But it didn't stop there. So while I was going through that depression, it was a chore for me to live day by day. It was a miracle that I was even living. Like I was, pro I was asking myself, I was convincing myself, just take this one day at a time. And because of that, I did not study. It was hard for me to study. So my grades fell. And every action has a consequence, right? So my GPA fell, my grades fell, and I failed three science classes. And as luck would have it, my university had just enacted a rule that if you fail more than three science classes in a row, you will be taken down from the program of all science programs. So I was completely in shock when I realized that I could no longer take science classes anymore. That was the end of my medical school dream and all my aspirations to serve in healthcare. I didn't know what to do, but at the time I was reading the Bhagavad Gita and, Swami, and Lord Krishna, and it says that career and everything in life is impermanent, that the only thing permanent is God. So I decided to, you know, realize, I, I decided that to accept it, I decided to accept my fate and decided to just change my career. So I changed my major a few times, but my inner voice kept saying, no, you're gonna do science. You're gonna do science no matter what. But I kept ignoring it because the university would not let me take science classes, right? So how is that gonna be possible? Um, so I decided to go with religious studies at one point. I, I clicked with it, but nothing worked out. I then switched to anthropology, nothing worked out. I kept switching my major, nothing worked out. And during this time, my grades continued to fall, continued to fall. So. What ended up happening was that my university kicked me out. But my inner voice just kept saying, no, you're going to do science classes. Don't even worry. I'm like, how is this even possible? So uh, at this point, I had no university to go to. So I decided to go to my community college and decided to finish my degree there. And as luck would have it, there was a biology degree uh, that was offered in my community college. So I decided to take it. And my grades shot up. My GPA shot up. And it was for the first time that my passion returned and my inner voice was right. I was, I was doing my science classes and everything was working out for me. But what ended up happening was that the university came back to me and they said, hey, we're so happy that your GPA is so good that we're gonna ask you to come back, but you're not gonna be able to do science classes here. So at this point I was like, what am I gonna do? Like my, my inner voice kept saying, no, you're gonna do science. But the university kept saying, nope, you're not gonna, you're not gonna do it. <laughs> so what, what am I supposed to do at this point? So I just, I was gonna have a mental breakdown, but all of a sudden I heard Swami speak through my heart. And he said, you are going to, you are going to graduate with a biology degree in the main campus auditorium, and you are going to do just even if they say no, it doesn't matter. Whatever I say is gonna happen. And all of a sudden I saw a vision of Swami showing me that wearing a cap and gown in the auditorium, receiving the biology degree diploma from the dean of the university. And I was left in shock because I was like, how's that gonna happen? Because this university just kept saying no. So I even called them. I was like, hey, are there any loopholes? Are you sure you're not letting me do any science classes? Not even one. And they said, nope. So I didn't know what to do, but I surrendered to Swami at that point. I was like, listen, if you're gonna give me this vision, then you're gonna have to fulfill it. Somehow, some way, I don't know how, but you're gonna have to do it. And next thing I knew, two days later, I found out that there was another campus from the same university that was actually closer to my house that had just started a biology degree program. So, and they took me, they, they accepted me with no qualms. So I decided to go there and I, finished my entire biology degree curriculum with perfect GPA, everything was great. And as I was graduating, I was about to graduate during the summer and because the graduating class was so small during summers, they make us go to the main campus to have 
a graduation ceremony there. <laughs> so I ended up graduating in that exact same auditorium that Swami showed me, in that exact same cap and gown, receiving the same exact biology degree diploma from that dean that I saw in the vision. And it was exactly, I was able to fulfill Swami's vision, but it wasn't me that did it. Swami showed me the way, he guided me, and he made it happen. So how do we intensify our sadhana in our day-to-day -day life? It's not about how many times you chant the mantra or how loud you chant or what's, what mantra you're gonna choose. It's about with what sincerity and with what faith you, have, you can have to chant to call out his name and with sincere yearning. When you, when you do that, God responds. And so I urge you guys to listen to that inner voice because it's there to guide you. You just have to surrender and have faith that he will come through and he will make it happen. No matter how many good and bad in the world happen, he will, take, he will carry you in his arms knowing that he will take you there. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your permission to, for the third speaker. Uh, I'm sure you know, we all appreciate it. So we want to move to the third section, which is around science and technology. Science and technology is e evolving at a rapid pace. And the Sci organization has embraced technology. In the last three years, thanks to the pandemic, we've all been using a lot of communications technologies. Uh, to take us through that, I'd like to invite uh, none other than Dr. Venkat Sadanand, who is a PhD from Caltech, uh, mathematics, economics major, and a neurosurgeon. Uh, so uh, I'm going to pass it over to him. But can I share that one slide, Nilesh? This one slide. Just why don't you guys all read this for a second? Take a second and read that. It looks like it came from uh, Dr. Govind's Scriptural Studies Committee. But actually, that's a question I asked Chat GPT, and that's what it told me. <laughs> my uh, most humble pronouns to my beloved Bhagwan Sri Sathya Sai Baba. Took off the mask so Swami can see me. Dear brothers and sisters, technology is a multi edged sword. And the question we are going to address in the next 25 minutes is how can we use technology to help spread Swami's message? To deliver this, uh, I'll briefly summarize uh, the use of technology in the SSIO, and then we'll have examples from people and ideas uh, from Manfred uh, and Pamela, and they're going to tell us a little bit about their thoughts on this as well. So first of all, I want to caution you about technology. <clears throat> in uh, 1945, July 16th, humanity exploded the first atom bomb. And when this humongous ball of fire was lit, Oppenheimer, Robert Oppenheimer's first thought was a um, rephrasing of uh, a verse from the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 11, number 32, where Swami talks about time as the destroyer of world, but he said, I have become death, the destroyer of all worlds. That was the thought in Robert Oppenheimer's mind. Technology has the power to do that, that power to destroy us that power to corrupt us, that power to make us its slaves. But we are not corruptible and we are not slaves. We should remain masters. And why I'm saying this is because Swami, for this precise reason, used to use the word technology. All of creation is 
two-edged or multi-edged. You know, the sun, you, it, it can burn you, or it can give you vitamins and energy, and it can grow food for you. The sword, as they say, or the knife uh, can kill, but can also cure. So we have to be careful how we use technology. We shouldn't just jump on a ship and say, I want to spread Swami's message using this new, newfound technology. In fact, if you look at it, more, imp you know, everything in the world, we say we should take the middle path, right? That's the Buddhist teaching. Take the middle path for everything except for one. And that is the pursuit of the inner divinity in you. There is no middle path for that. It is one focus. Like Dr. Reddy was saying, you, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa was rubbing his nose on the floor. That's not middle path. Because the pursuit of the divine is the only one for which middle path is excused. For everything else, there should be middle. So what's the middle path in using technology to further our goal in spreading Swami's message? In this process, I want you to keep in mind the importance of how we view technology. There are many innovations. That is not technology. Those are innovations. We tend to think in the business world about disruption of technology and people get excited. You know, this is new technology, it'll disrupt something. Disruption is not the goal. The goal is stability and progress. The prime example of a company that follows stability of technology and progress through technology is Apple. I'm pointing here because of Shiva. Apple through it, all these folding technology of phone and you know, seeing through the screen and recognize, all these technologies existed for the last three or four years. Apple hasn't adopted it, it waits, it sees. Is this stable or not? What are the problems from this? So we have to proceed with caution and take the middle path. Does it pay? Most uh, ma market capitalization of Apple is $2.6 trillion. That's more than any company, more than Samsung, more than Google. And the reason is, it doesn't jump into technology. So in the SSIO, our goal is to use technologies that are stable, that are proven. We will explore technologies, but use comes later. So for example, this is a beautiful example, ChatGPT. Okay, AI is one of the fields I work in. ChatGPT uses a engine, type of engine called transformers. It is part of this large language modeling where a set of words have to be used and the machine reads it, tries to predict the meaning or the next set of words that should follow. But the problem with that, as you all may know, is you get erroneous results. And these erroneous results are not what we want. But we should observe, we should see what this technology is doing, where it is going before we adopt it. Imagine if we could have a system, BARD had a problem, BARD is the Google version of ChatGPT, and they had a problem. Imagine if we could have something where I sit there and I say, Swami, I, I'm having this problem in life right now. What did you say about this problem? And an answer comes to you. That is what we want. But that's not where we are. That's not where this technology is. Search engines that we can use through this process of either transformers or another type of ML models are called generators. Those are going to take time before they can be accurate, before they can be predictable, before they can really help us. Right now, it's a novelty. Let novelties have their position in life. So with that word of caution about technology, I want to tell you what beautiful things that SSIO is already doing and wants to do further. One of this, you have all experienced and participated in, and that is the online communications. During the pandemic, we were strapped down without the freedom to be able to interact with each other. That was new, that never happened before. And suddenly, we are there in our own little cubicles and we have to be able to worship God. We want to be able to spread his message. How do we do that? And so we used existing technologies. We didn't innovate, but we used existing technologies that are proven and stable streaming of services, right? We had so many, we kept going almost 
not almost, every month we had some program or the other and the participation was humongous. One of the beauties of the SSIO, one of the beauties of the technologies that we use is that, and this is true everywhere, if you innovate, you will find that there are people who don't like your innovations. So you have to be confident in what you're doing. And if there are barriers, you break them. And that's what we've been doing. That's why you're enjoying, you've been enjoying these online programs, various streaming services that we have used, various ways, various innovations we have learned in this process. But what has been done is now ready to be used in tandem with physical meetings such as this, and that's exactly what's happening right now. We have live broadcast of this, we have recorded broadcasts of this, these meetings in the previous days, and we will keep those recordings for the future. So there are ways by which we have innovated already quietly, silently, so that you can enjoy Swami's messages and we can spread it. Your job is to consume, but not just to stop there. We provide you the technology to consume Swami's message, but please don't stop there. The purpose of this is not consumption. The purpose of this is for you to each be a beacon to spread. It's called geometric progression. And the growth is what is referred to as a logarithmic growth. It, it just shoots up. And the growth is what is referred to as a logarithmic growth. It, it just shoots up. If each of us becomes a beacon of this message of Swami, then that is your purpose in life. That is the purpose of you being in SSI. Of course, I can grow too. We can all grow. We hear this message, we grow, but do we want to be selfish and just sit in our room, grow, and, and stop at that? No. We want to take Swami's messages outside, and you're being fed the stream of messages through technologies that you can use. Bring more people into the, into the fold, into the organization, just so that they can hear Swami through you. That's who you are. You are a beacon. You are the voice of God. There used to be a little newspaper, newsletter when I was a student called the voice of God. You are that voice of God. He's not going to come in this, from the sky and say, oh, ye all you behold this. You are it. Are you doing your duty? Are you doing your job, not as a member of SSIO, but as a human being to show gratitude to him? And the best way to show that gratitude is to spread his message. Don't ever stop spreading his message. If there are barriers, if there are problems, talk to us. All the officers are available for you. The organization is available for you. If you have problems spreading Swami's message, talk to us. We'll find a way to go over those barriers. Let this be not the one that destroys. Let this technology be the one that spreads Swami's message. Okay? So I'm going to call Manfred to come here and he's going to give us some innovative ideas. And then uh, Pamela, she's going to give us some innovative ideas as well. And then we'll go from there. I'm going to open it up for Q&A. So please think of questions that you can ask this panel. Thank you so much. So you all know P Manfred already. So um, I will have him talk to you about a very beautiful innovation using solar panels. Right. So I am again. So, I'm convinced that everything we need in order to take such a SAI organization forward is already there. Sometimes we simply don't see it. We have heard about the principles how Swami is doing his work and that he asked us, just do one step and I will come 99 steps forward to you. Thinking about this principle, I was thinking of how to make one of the most important aspects of the SAI organization more stable, and this is the schools we have all over the world. In these schools, hundreds and thousands of children get this seed we were talking about implanted. And they are the ones to take us forward for the future. The key is education. 
And in order to provide this education, we need schools that are stable. And each organization, each institution, and each school is dependent on having enough resources. And resources in that case means also money. Teachers have to be paid. Books have to be paid. S pupils have to be fed. All this needs, at the end of the day, money. So how can we stabilize the situation of these schools? And my idea was, I go one step forward them, and Swami will take the rest and will do the other steps. So as I'm chair of a foundation in Germany, I, I took this idea and said, well, okay, we are willing to approach schools, and if these schools are willing to set up a solar system in order to generate their own energy, they will save the cost of this energy. And when these solar panels produce even more energy than the school needs, then they can sell it to the power companies and get some income out of it. So what we did was we simply, we simply provided this idea. And then the first school that did it was a school in Brazil. And the Psycare Foundation financed that and said, okay, one third of the investment you will get as a donation, two third you will get as a loan interest free. And when you make some money out of this idea, you can pay back this loan, which enables us to give it to the next school, and if it functions, to give it to the next school. And this is what we did, an idea to use technology in order to make our schools more independent. And you can do the same thing with greenhouses, grow your own vegetable, take it in order to feed the pupils, and what you produce more, sell it on the market, create some income, and be more independent. This is an idea how technology can take us further and spread education. And I want to, I, I just want to make it clear in one sentence more what Venka just said. What makes this conference probably the best conference ever is not that 600 people are gathered here and that you consume Swami's love. But when you really take it serious, what Venka just said, you only have to do two things. You put Swami's values in your right pocket and you put Swami's values in your left pocket and you don't keep it there. You don't keep it as a secret. You don't keep it as a present that you yourself have got. But you take these two presents out of the pocket and share it with one other person. Then out of these 600, immediately the number doubles and we have 1,200. And if you are convincing in spreading the values and the love, these 1,200 will do the same thing. And then it will be 2,400. And then it will be 4,800. And then it is unstoppable. This is what mathematics does. So. Go home and don't forget to empty your pockets. Saira. Thank you. Thank you, brother. I, I think that message is really uh, uh, almost bottom line, that don't just be a consumer. Please be a beacon. 
Every one of you who has a bank account knows what it means to be a beacon. Because if you put money there, it gets interest. Then that money plus interest gets interest. Then the money plus interest plus interest gets interest. Right? That's what we want to do. That's the geometric progression. So please, each of you, you have a God-bound duty to take Swami's message through the channels SSIO has opened up to you and start spreading that. Each of you must do that, please. I would like to see 700 people here, 700 hits on our website, so you take the message, and the next day there should be 1,400, as he said, and so on and so forth. But we need to be engaged. We can't just be consumers. That is a tragedy. If our life ends, we never know when it'll end, but you don't want it to end as a consumer. Okay? The next person is Pamela Barona. She's from Mexico, and she's very heavily involved with the IT and media operations in Mexico. Um, her own expertise professionally, as well as for the SSIO, SSSIO, is in the field of media. So I'm go she has some wonderful ideas about how we can uh, incorporate newer technologies in spreading Swami's message among the young adults. Pamela, please go ahead. Thank you. Hi, Ram. Uh, <laughs> I'm really happy and I'm really blessed to be here with you and can share my experience about how I uh, arrived to the organization. And it has all the sense because technology for me has a really impact uh, for being here with you today. So a couple of years ago, I started to search my spiritual path and technology had um, a really uh, approach to Swami's message. So I just started to, to serve to Swami without a reason for being honest. So I've been working for the media team in Mexico um, doing all my professional uh, work and I realized three years ago that I'm in a good area that I wanted to share Swami's message and I started and the technology started to to um, uh, show me that we can share Swami's message through technology because I've been in the leadership course so now I'm interested that every single uh, young adult can spread, and even you can spread the message through technology, right? All of you have a, a phone, all of you have an iPad, all of you have an, uh, an access to, to internet. So in that certain point, you can be a side reporters. So in that sense about technology, in this pan pandemic, we wanted to engage to the people for all over the world to get into Zoom meetings, be in a retreat that are streaming. So uh, I wanted to share with you that every single technology that we have in our hands, it could be an impact for other people. And we don't need a magical or a big formula to share all these Swami's messages, message. So uh, I feel very nervous, sorry. <laughs> I got some of my ideas spread, but the impact of technology that we've been uh, working on the organization has uh, among us, among us, uh, how? Yeah, no, you, you're doing very well, Pamela, <laughs> you're doing very well. And you have beautiful ideas. You mentioned you can tell them about Kahoot type of teaching aids where this interactive teaching and Satya education can make use of that. So go ahead. Yes, also in education we can do, we can uh, take advantage of many media gadgets and also apps that can uh, teach all the, the teachers and get like this, um, uh, <laughs> sorry take this, uh, engage with the children, with the people that can impact a lot in, in their lives. So what, what she has is a beautiful way by which 
um, Swami's words and uh, Satisai education can spread through interactive technologies. That means, you know, there are all these students, but there's SSE classes here and SSE classes there, and I say another country. All of them can engage interactively. Questions and answers can be answered. Teachers can pose questions when there can be competitions. You'll know how other children are doing. What is the truth about this? What is the misunderstanding about this? So interactive exchange of education. That is the thing that she's trying to build, which I think is very nice way to spread Swami's message. So thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, it will be very, very fast, yes. Um, the third person is a technology guru uh, who was the first person to come here and talk to you, and that is Harish. Do you? Okay. We, it seems that we are standing between you and food. <laughs> okay. So we will end here, but I'll have Harish end the, end the meeting. Sairam, and thank you very much. Sairam, thank you, uh, Dr. Susan and Tech Manfred. Thank you, sister. Um, I hope, you know, we, 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 we are trying to understand what we want to do with these 90 minutes, you know, innovative ideas. It's not like we can come up with some new ideas that we can all take. But the thought was to get people to share how they're using the organization and Swami's teachings uh, in the personal lives and how they're taking the assets that the organization has and spreading the message in the community. And hopefully that sparks some takeaways for all of us that we can then implement in our own uh, areas and regions. So with that, uh, we are very grateful to all the panelists, all the speakers, and to Swami uh, for making this um, innovative ideas going forward session happen. Jai Sairam. <laughs>